Hey, Husker fans, welcome to another episode of the Husker Big Red Podcast with Chris Peterson and Danny Gillette. As always, go Big Red. Welcome back, Husker fans, to another episode of the Husker Big Red Podcast. I'm Chris Peterson, and Danny Gillette is joining me again. As always, it's Monday morning. It's been a busy weekend for Nebraska. And how are you holding up, Danny? The Patriots season is finally over, so <sighs> finally been put out of your misery. Up. I don't have to write about that team anymore, at least until April, and hopefully we can get a good draft pick. But uh, bogged down by snow, I'm pretty cold. Uh, I'm not having a good time. But, you know, Nebraska's red-hot success on the recruiting trail is warming me up. It was a big weekend on the recruiting trail, and we'll get to that in just a second. Um, if you guys haven't done us the favor yet, please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of our content. Um, hit the like button, get into the comment section. Um, it really does help us out and helps grow our content. But as you mentioned, Danny, um, you know, a big weekend for Nebraska on the recruiting trail. Uh, you know, they get Isaiah Naor, the wide receiver, committed on uh, Friday night. We talked about that quite a bit on our live stream on Saturday. If you guys missed that, um, you can check out the replay there on the channel. Um, and then Saturday night, you know, Dan Dante Dowdell, you know, took his visit and didn't even, you know, waste time. Uh, didn't even leave Nebraska before he made his decision. I don't think he, you know, was there with Dylan Rayola, announced the commitment on Saturday night. And this is a monster addition for Nebraska. I mean, Dylan Rayola was huge, but this outside of Dylan Rayola, this might be the biggest addition to this Nebraska team this offseason, in my opinion. And it fills a need, right? We, we were all saying that they needed a running back, and they did. Uh, and now they have Dante Dowdell, who also kind of takes away the sting of the Kawan Lacey D commitment from back in October. And this is a guy that's a very strong runner. He's extremely fast, but he also plays with a little bit of physicality. So I think his style of play will fit well in the Big Ten. Um, you know, you're talking about a guy that could honestly probably come in and be the starting running back. Now, what does that mean for Emmett Johnson? I know there's stuff about him floating around and rumors and things like that, but I think we'll probably wait until after spring ball before we see, you know, any movement, if any at all, in the running back room. But as for now, you know, Nebraska has a legitimate one-two punch in the backfield with Emmett and uh, Dante Dowdell. And this fills a really big need on the roster overall that, you know, was missing up until Saturday. What I like about Dowdell is this isn't, and this isn't to say anything bad about guys coming from the group of five or the FCS, but he's not he's not an up transfer. This is from this guy's coming from Oregon, which is one of the best programs in the country in terms of just recruiting talent. And he would have had a chance to play there, I think, if they didn't have you know some of their guys returning. Um, they also mismanaged his red shirt. I mean, he blew a red shirt season for 17 carries. And uh in the first game of the season, I think he got six carries. So after that, he the last two games in which were the fifth and sixth game, he only got like a combined four carries. So Oregon really kind of messed up with his red shirt. Although I guess if you're Talia Talgavailoa or whatever, you'll just get a free year so you can enter the portal. So maybe Dante Dowdell can get an extra year, you know, when he's, a, if he wants to, but um, I, I a hundred percent agree that I think he is going to be the starter. I mean, he just, he's six to two fifteen. He was ranked in the top 10, by all the recruiting sites coming out of high school, 24-7, uh, the composite had him as 194th overall, and he was the number nine running back, and he did average 5.2 yards per carry last season. So when he got on the field, he was productive, and I think beyond that, he's a perfect fit for Nebraska. He Obviously, he can do the spread run and all that type of stuff, but Nebraska wants to get that fullback in there, and I think, that, you know, that, not that they do it all the time, but that is the type of system I think that's going to fit really well with Dowdell. And then you look at giving your quarterback, you know, a potential a strong running game because you put Dowdell and then Emmett Johnson, if they can, you know, keep him here, um, and, you know, Gabe Irvin, Ramir Johnson, you know, behind an offensive line that's returning. Uh, basically, it's top six players, um, you know, and uh, well, probably even deeper than that. Like they really aren't losing anybody on the offensive line. Plus, they're adding guys like Gibson Pyle and Grant Bricks. So I feel like Nebraska is set up to run the football pretty well. And that's going to be, you know, a positive thing, I think, for Dylan Raiola playing his quarterback as his true freshman next season. And you mentioned Ramir Johnson and Gabe Irvin. I mean, like we talked about on Saturday, it's just worth repeating. You know, I love 
Ramir and Gabe, and I think they're really good running backs, but they have had trouble staying healthy. So Dowdell also, in a way, kind of gives you an extra insurance policy in case, you know, those two go down at any point in the season. And I think that's crucial as well because we saw, you know, the the injuries at the beginning of the season last year at the position ultimately paved the way for Emmett Johnson to really show what he could do. But it wasn't a situation that you really wanted to be in if you were Nebraska. No, it wasn't. There, there just wasn't enough depth in the room, um, you know, at the running back position. And, I mean, I like all these guys. I like, you know, the fact that Nebraska's got two big backs now in, um, you know, Dowdell and Gabe Urban. Because Gabe Urban averaged over five yards a carry last year. Like, he was productive before he got hurt. So, if he can find that again. Um, but now Nebraska's not having to 100% rely on that. If he if he comes through, that's great. If not, they still have another guy. And Quentin Ives, too. I mean, he he I expect him to take a jump this year. Um, Ramir Johnson is going to help in special teams. I mean, he losing him in the kick return game was um, obviously a big blow. And then I think with a with a more accurate quarterback too, it's going to be easier to get him involved in those little running back. You know, like the, the, it's easy to say like, oh, throw these swing passes and throw the angle routes and that type of stuff. But you have to be accurate with those passes and you have to put a certain amount of zip on it. And that just wasn't really in the cards for these Nebraska quarterbacks last season. Plus, they didn't have any weapons downfield to kind of distract you know from the running back. So I think. Ramirez going to have a chance to, you know, be more involved in the passing game next year. Like we've said for the past two years, I just think they'll have a quarterback that's more able to execute that. And look, yeah, the, I mean, I understand if you're Emmett Johnson, you want to look around. I do believe the transfer portals closed. I mean, I see guys keep jumping in there, so I guess I don't really know the dates, but I, I feel like you can go in if you're a graduate. So, I mean, he, I believe would have to wait until the spring and, and see how this all shakes out. And look, I mean, they're all going to get, touches that's the thing is like even if Dowdell starts like you're not gonna the, nobody I don't think anybody should be giving a guy you know 25 carries every because they're not gonna last so whoever is playing running back like you're gonna get opportunities and so I, I feel like you know we'll see how it plays out but hopefully this is the room that we go into the fall with I would if there was any movement I would obviously expect uh, you know until after spring honestly if Johnson's not the number two back. I could see him transferring out, but I'm hoping he stays. And this is the room we go into fall with because, you know, if everything works out, you know, the way we want it to, then I think we have a very dangerous running back room on top of a dangerous wide receiver room and a quarterback that can throw the football. And, you know, let's not just say one quarterback that can throw the football, two quarterbacks that can throw the football with Danny Kalen you know, also available in case of an emergency. But he's in case of emergency right now, but I think the future is going to be extremely bright with him as well. So, And uh, as we did mention before we move on to some other topics, you know, Isaiah Nayor con con committed on Friday, um, a 6'3", 215-pound receiver um, from Texas, previously was at Wyoming. When he transferred from Wyoming, he was one of the top players in the transfer portal he got hurt, had an ACL injury, but averaged 20 yards per reception back in 2021, um, is healthy now. He had a 60-yard touchdown in the Texas spring game last year, but only one reception this season. They obviously are pretty loaded and, you know, just a numbers thing, but quality player for Nebraska. And then the other receiver, uh, Jamal Banks. So that was kind of one question we talked about, you know, would Nebraska take two wide receivers? It does seem like the answer to that is yes. Um, they took Nayor. They still had Banks visiting. Um, he told 24-7 Sports that, um, he's going to be making a decision midweek or by the end of the week. So, you know, it feels like Michigan's the other contender. I guess that could still leave the door open, you know, if if like Jim Harbaugh decides to return or whatever, and maybe he would go to Michigan either way. But it's just I have a hard time, like I said, I have a hard time seeing him committing to Michigan with that, you know, hanging up in the air when he could just commit to Nebraska. And it seems like he really enjoyed the visit. He talked about the family atmosphere. Um, he could play with a five-star quarterback. So back-to-back 600-yard receiving seasons for banks so this would be another you know quality addition to the wide receiver room yeah and it would kind of solidify the wide receiver room as well you have two veterans uh, and then you have you know the younger guys and coleman and lloyd they're not freshmen anymore but they're not they don't have as much experience as you know banks and Nayor. but i mean you look at both you know banks and Nayor, for example and their deep ball threats they they're extremely athletic and you notice all of these wide receivers from Coleman to Nayor to Banks, they all have height. 
They all have height and they're all big receivers. So that's something to be excited about as well. Nebraska is recruiting a profile of wide receiver that that relies on height, speed, and athleticism. And that's the perfect fit for this offense. And I know people wanted to fire Marcus Satterfeld last year, but I'm really curious to see what Satterfeld can do in terms of, you know, this iteration of the offense now that he has playmakers at his disposal, because I think we're going to see drastically different results this year because, you know, this type of offense, you know, they aired out with the tall playmakers, tall wide receivers with a pocket passing quarterback is more of what he wants to run. Yeah, I think so. And um, speaking of, you know, the the coaching staff and the offensive staff and uh, Marcus Satterfield, I think it should we should bring up um, what I think is the most actually important news of this entire weekend, maybe outside of the Dowdell thing. But Nebraska in talks with former Houston and West Virginia head coach Dana Holgerson to join the staff. Now, um, he has worked for Mike Leach. He's worked for Hal Mummy. He's coached numerous quarterbacks that have had 4000 yard seasons. He's coached guys in the NFL. Um, so, I mean, he's of great mind in terms of, you know, the passing game and, and different things like that. So what are your, what, what are your thoughts um, or what, what are your reactions to, uh, you know, this news and, and, you know, do you want Dana Holgerson at Nebraska? Yeah. I mean, we need a quarterbacks coach, I think, uh, you know, especially when you're trying to develop two young quarterbacks, you need somebody who's dedicated specifically to the position. I mean, you just kind of mentioned his resume. He, he has quite the resume in of itself. He actually, led Houston to a bowl game in 2021 as the 17th overall ranked team in the country. And so he has a bevy of experience, you know, throughout football as a head coach, as an assistant. And so I think he would be a great addition. Um, you know, we need somebody who's dedicated to quarterbacks. And, you know, he's served this role before. It's not like we're just trying to find – you know, a guy for a quarterback's coach and say, and say, here you go. I mean, he was the quarterback's coach dating all the way back to 1996 um, when he, you know, worked with Mississippi College. Mississippi State, he served the same position before that. And then, you know, he's also been the quarterback's coach at Houston and Oklahoma State. And at both those places, you know, he also served – as the offensive coordinator. And I do think it's important for a quarterback's coach to have some sort of offensive coordinator background because, you know, a quarterback's coach is more than just, you know, throw the ball here, move your eyes this way, yada, yada, yada. It's about trying to understand the wrinkles and developments within the offense so that you can teach the quarterback properly. And I think having someone with an offensive coordinator background as well uh, we'll be able to, you know, help, help him relay the information, you know, hypothetically to the quarterbacks. And with how young our quarterback room is, I think that's going to be important as well. So I would personally really like this. We need a quarterback's coach. And I think Holgerson, you know, he he doesn't have a shoddy resume. It's very, very good. So I'd be happy to add him to the staff for sure. Yeah, I think it would be a home run. I mean, you look at what he's done throughout the course of his career. Like I said, worked with Hal Mummy, who you know is is uh, you know one of the originators of the air raid offense. Um, he worked for Mike Leach, obviously for many years, but he's had a lot of you know success. He was offensive coordinator at Texas Tech when they had Graham Harrell and all those guys, uh, Michael Crabtree throwing for all those yards. Um, you know, Case Keenum, he coached him. Um, so th there's been a lot of a lot of success with this guy and. You know, I'm not saying that Nebraska needs to go full air raid. I don't think that's going to be the plan by any means. I don't think they're going to overhaul the offense. But I think that this would be a great addition just to teach quarterbacks. And honestly, I think that you should make um, this guy quarterbacks coach and passing game coordinator. That's what I that's what I would call him. I mean, Satterfield can still call the plays, but, you know, bring in this guy to help you construct like a, a truly dynamic passing offense, um, help develop these quarterbacks. And he's also got. A lot of ties to Texas. I mean, he coached at Oklahoma State. You know, he coached Brandon Whedon to, you know, first team all Big 12. So, you know, he's done it at numerous, you know, like that's four or five places where he's productively, you know, coached quarterbacks. And, you know, you look at this offense, there's a lot of there's a lot of weapons on this team and there's no excuse for this offense to not, you know, be 
worlds better than it is this year, you know, and and I get that they're probably going to have a, a freshman starting quarterback. Like, I don't care. The guy's still an upgrade talent wise over what we had. And with all the weapons. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's better than what we have. And I don't want yeah. to hear anybody say, Oh, we have a freshman. He he's, he's better than what we have. And granted the bar wasn't high based off of last year, but I mean, this kid's the real deal. Yeah. And he's polished. He's played this game. You know, I mean, he's played, he had one interception last year. And like I said, there's going to be mistakes. There might yeah. be, you know, he might have a game where he throws three interceptions, you know, where where he gets tricked in coverage, where, you know, te- some, and that's fine. That's going to happen. That's part of the learning curve. But it's better to, I mean, it all goes well. If all goes according to his plan, he's going to be gone after three years. So don't mess around with having him on. Yeah, that's, and I'm glad that Matt Rule's not going to do that. I, you know, he's going to be starting week one. And look, they've got, they're, they're building the pieces around him where he doesn't have to be. You know, he doesn't have to be Peyton Manning next season. He doesn't have to be Caleb Williams or C.J. Stroud. I mean, they're going to run the football a bunch next year, and I think they're going to be pretty darn good at it. So the other thing I like about it is, you know, when you can actually when you can, when you you can actually run an offense, when your quarterback does like a true play action fake, when you turn your back to the defense, which Nebraska does still do that, and I want to see them do that more, that matters. And that, that helps create explosive plays, and not a ton of teams, you know, do that in college. And, yeah, Holgerson's not a guy that – has done probably a lot of that. That's why I don't want to see him, you know, they need to meld the offense and make it be Matt Rule's offense. But, like, he talked about the 49ers. The 49ers are one of the few teams, you know, they run that Shanahan system in the NFL that still turns the quarterbacks back to the defense. And that play action, that that little action, if you can do that and you can protect it, that helps create explosive plays and it makes it a lot easier for your quarterback. But you have to be able to run the football and you have to be able to protect your quarterback. But I think Nebraska – We'll be able to do both of those things very effectively next season. Not to mention when you have, you know, a, a new group of offensive linemen, including two who represented very well at the All American Bowl this past weekend. And I think that's going to make a big difference as well. And not to go off on a tangent here, but I heard really good things about Gibson Pyle over the course of the All American Bowl week. You know, same thing with Bricks. I saw Carter and Nelson catching passes and, you know, making plays. So, it's good to see, you know, those three in particular show up and shine on a national stage. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I think Pyle was an absolute steal. You know, you talk about how, you know, these coaches are known for getting diamonds in the rough and evaluating players. Pyle is more than a diamond in the rough. He is going to be a quality lineman for this program. Yeah, Nebraska's got a few three-star steals, we could call them, I believe. And, yeah, Gibson Pyle definitely is one of those guys. Um, I 100% believe he's going to be a starting guard for Nebraska, and I think he's going to be a pro someday. I just really – I can see that development process, you know, with how he plays. And, um, yeah, he's going to be a fan – he's going to be a fan favorite for sure. And, you know, one thing, too, you talk about, like, the quarterback position and how it's going to be different – like last year, if teams wanted to put eight people in the box, there wasn't that much Nebraska could really do to prevent that. They had to run against a heavy box the entire season. Um, and so, like, especially when, like, Harburg was out there, you know, that's what they just loaded the box because it's like, okay, beat us throwing the ball because we know that you can't do it. Um, and Jeff Sims, I mean, same thing. So the thing about it, if you put an eight-man box against Nebraska this year, like, guess what? We're bombing the ball down the field to Malachi and Jalen Lloyd and, you know, Isaiah Nayor and some of these other guys, and they've got the ability to actually complete those passes and and test the defense and and whether or not you know you can always complete those passes or whatever. Like you're gonna have to respect that now with Dylan Riola because he can he can hit Malachi Coleman on a dime fifty yards down the field no problem. Whereas last year that was pretty shaky. So that that's I I just think having a quarterback and having more balance is just going to completely change the way people defend Nebraska too. And so. It's going to be a lot different than having eight guys loaded into the box every single time you're running the football because there's no threat of a passing game. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it'll also allow for Nebraska to experiment in terms of play calling as well to try to dial up different plays. It's not going to be the same quarterback run or, you know, the same deep pass. It's going to allow them the freedom to truly run an offense and keep the defense off balance because I think last year it was just, okay, we're going to run. And, you know, try to stop us. And some teams did and some teams didn't. And now I think you're going to see, you know, the play call sheet is going to open up a little bit more than it did last year. And then uh, we'll get now to a little basketball talk here. We got a few more minutes left in the show. Um, Unfortunately, Saturday wasn't a great day for the Huskers. They ran into a buzzsaw with Wisconsin, 88 to 72. And 
what's what's crazy, you know, this Wisconsin team's really good, uh, but they only averaged six three point makes per game or averaged six three point makes per game coming in. They made 13 on Saturday. They made 50 percent of their three. So, I mean, not only is this a really good team, but Nebraska just caught them on a day where they, you know, literally shot the ball out of their minds. I mean, Nebraska made 12 three pointers. Nebraska made 12 three pointers and they got outscored at the three point line. So really um, the, the offense played well. The defense, it was a rough day, but, you know, this Wisconsin team's really good. So, I, you know, I, I'm not pressing the panic button on this Nebraska team by any means. No, I mean, Tyler Wall for Wisconsin was absolutely fantastic. I mean, Nebraska had to either respect the perimeter or respect Tyler Wall. And if you completely devoted your attention to one, you were leaving the other absolutely wide open. And so it wasn't a Nebraska issue there. It was just a you know, pick your poison, and by the time Nebraska was able to defend Tyler Wall, that opened the perimeter, and vice versa. I mean, this is probably one of the best Wisconsin teams I've seen in years. I don't think they're going to be ranked um, in the, you know, 20s for long. I think they're going to be, you know, a highly ranked team by the end of the season. Uh, this is a team that has historically had experience in March, and you know, even the, you know, players off the bench for Wisconsin were going bananas from three. So, I mean, it just shows, you know, how deep this Wisconsin team is. And even though we lost, I don't really think that's a bad loss because I thought we played well. Wisconsin was just really, really good. I was actually very impressed with, with you know, what they're able to do. I mean, as a basketball fan, it was fun to watch. As a Nebraska fan, it absolutely sucked. But you know, props to them. I mean, they definitely earned the victory on, on Saturday. And uh, so some a tough, you know, the schedule is not going to be easy. We know that. Um, so Tuesday, tomorrow, um, we got Purdue coming in here, eight, um, eight o'clock central time to the vault. Um, obviously, I believe they're ranked number one. Mm -hmm. um, we, we know what happened last time. Nebraska was so close to pulling the upset. We'll see. I think obviously the vault's going to be rocking. And um, then after that, a game on Friday at Iowa, and then a game at Rutgers, then a couple home games. So this, you know, it's, uh, you know, because you lose this game, you're two and three in the Big Ten, and Nebraska's got to get, I think, 10, 11 Big Ten wins. So just to keep that in mind, but I expect to see, you know, good effort, a good strong effort from the Huskers on Tuesday night against Purdue. Yeah, I mean, you know, this upcoming schedule is a gauntlet. I mean, there's no easy team. In the Big Ten, I mean, even Rutgers is a challenge. I mean, they have a really good, uh, they have a really good solid program, and you know, they they always play tough. So it's not going to be an easy slate, but I feel like we're going to find out a lot about this team moving forward. Um, you know, Purdue is going to be tough. I mean, last year we got hosed by some terrible officiating. I mean, I don't like to complain about the refs too too much, but there were some pretty big calls in that one that were not called. So. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. I mean, to me, Saturday was very telling against Wisconsin in the sense that, you know, Nebraska, I thought Nebraska looked good. Wisconsin was just that much better, in my opinion. So, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. I'd love to see a little bit more point production out of Jamarcus Lawrence. Um, you know, he, I think he had only three points on um, Saturday. And, you know, when you look at, you know, his point production, um, you know, he had 13 or 12, excuse me, against Indiana uh, last Wednesday. And, you know, the Husker offense is certainly a little bit better when he's, you know, putting up those types of numbers. So I'd love to see a little bit more production out of him. He's been kind of hot and cold. You know, he's had stretches 12 against Indiana. On Wednesday, 14 points against, you know, North Dakota on December 29th. And then, you know, three points the game before that on December 17th against against Kansas State. So, I mean, he's been hot and cold. I just hope the hot Jamarcus Lawrence shows up and, you know, he's able to get involved in the offense. Yeah, and the bigs are going to have to play well tomorrow, all of them, and Nebraska is going to have to shoot the, you know, shoot the three well, and probably get a great night from, probably get like twenty points from uh, Kase Tomanaga. So, we'll see. It's always fun to watch this team play, though. Um, unfortunately, it is going to be on Peacock tomorrow, just to give you guys the heads up. So, make sure you got your subscription still, or if you need to get your free trial out of the way, <laughs> go ahead and do that tomorrow. But um, at any rate, number one Purdue coming in, so that should be a fun matchup, and. Uh, 
yeah, I believe that'll uh, wrap it up. Do you have any final thoughts, though, Danny? I got to check and see if I have my Peacock subscription still. That's the one that just popped into my head right there. But, um, no, I'm just excited about football. I'm excited about football. I'm excited about basketball. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just ready for winter to be over. I know it's only January, but I'm excited for the spring game and uh, brighter times ahead. So, I mean, I think overall it was a pretty good weekend and uh, things are looking up for Nebraska. That they definitely are. And if you guys want to, you know, keep in, uh, keep track of everything that's going on with Nebraska, make sure you guys hit the subscribe button to our channel here, hit the like button, get into the comment section and please follow us at huskerbigred.com. We have a lot more information there as well. Um, so check that out. And uh, as always guys, go big red, go big red.